swim, bike, run. This is Endurance FM with Graham Brown. Hello and welcome to Endurance FM. My name is Graham Brown. This is all about the journey of the endurance sport entrepreneur. And one journey that I want to share with you today is a remarkable story of a man originally from Australia, Travis McKenzie, now in Vancouver, Canada. We're going to talk about his journey, how he faced a life-threatening crash and how it changed his life. We're going to talk about how he left the comfort of a salaried life, went and scratched his entrepreneurial itch and running down the chute of Kona Ironman Hawaii in 1992 and everything in between. Endurance FM. Voice of the endurance sports business. Welcome to the show, Travis. Graham, thanks for having me. I'm uh, excited to be here. Fantastic. Well, you've got a, a very interesting resume Ironman, entrepreneur, Kona qualifier in 2014, and soon to be dad. Where do we start? Let's talk about Ironman first and your love of that sport. Started pretty young, right? We've got to go way back. Tell us about how you got into that first. Yeah, I, uh, it's definitely way back and I was lucky enough to grow up in Australia, as you mentioned, uh, the early nineties triathlon was a, a booming sport and, and there's a lot of opportunities for people to race around the country. Um, usually there would be a race every single weekend. Um, and, uh, we would be able to go and travel to those races with my dad, who was a, an amazing athlete. Um, he was an amateur, but he was in his forties and he would, you know, win most races or a lot of his age group races and finish in the on the podium overall a lot of times and I kind of saw him as a bit of a hero and anyway he qualified for Kona in 1992 and it was uh I think it might have actually been our first trip as a family overseas if I remember correctly so as a 10 year old kid super excited to go and uh, visit the US and uh, most importantly to go and watch the the Ironman in Kona so that was my first introduction to a an Ironman event and uh, they're watching Greg Welsh compete as a as a an elite there for Australia. But uh, yeah, I got a chance to run down the finish route with my dad and it was kind of one of the coolest things that I, I remember and uh, it really cemented my love for triathlon in particular and uh, and the longer distance of, of that sport. So, Fantastic. Yeah. So this was the era of Mark Allen, Dave Scott maybe, Paul and Newby Fraser. Those yeah. would have been the names of 1992, right? I mean, yeah. guys running in Speedos. Was it kind of different scene to what it is now? I mean, we all see it on NBC. We see it on TV. How was it back then? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a big production these days. Um, it, back then, it was it was still, you know, it was a big event. You're closing down the main highway in Hawaii, but it was uh, it was more of a community style event. Mm-hmm. There was um, there wasn't the infrastructure that there is now, and I actually remember going to Kona to do a training camp a couple of years ago and seeing the massive cruise ships um, docked off in the ocean. And I was like, it's not, it wasn't like that back in the early nineties. It was still a kind of a small town race, but um, it's definitely a huge, huge production now, as you know, and lots of money and resources spent uh, around that particular event. Mm. But you were 10 years old back then. I'm curious to know what kind of impression that imprinted upon you being a 10 year old kid first vacation abroad with the family that must have been exciting as you say going away seeing a dad who was your hero compete running down the chute what sort of impression did that leave you coming away from that event and how do you think that sort of changed you in the coming years yeah i think i think just growing up uh, growing up around that that lifestyle and that culture just imprinted a like anything is possible kind of attitude like Mm. you know that was a, a massive event and like having competed in a, a lot of Ironmans, you know how much it is goes into it training wise and racing wise. But at that time I didn't have an, an understanding of the level of effort, but I, it just showed me that like you could actually do anything you wanted to do. And if you set your mind to something, you can achieve it. And for, a, you know, an impressionable kid like that, um, that le- left a huge uh, impression on me. And I think just this the community and the love of the sport was grown from being able to stand at Digby Beach and get autographs mm. from Dave Scott and Ken Glar and Mark Allen and Greg Walsh and all these like guys and girls who are heroes in the sport and they'd be there you know to give you a pat on the back and sign an autograph it was just a really cool experience and it just um as I say cemented that love I have for the sport and uh, and showed me that anything is possible with uh with the right attitude and some good hard work. Awesome. We'll talk about how that 
sort of manifested later on in your life with your entrepreneurial journey as well. Let's hold that thought for a minute and come back to where you are in your Ironman journey because you know, it wasn't always a straight line, was it? It wasn't always an easy path to you. I mean, it, Iron Man is difficult. But then, you know, there's this incident, what I want to talk about. I think this is pretty pivotal. 7th of March, 2015. And if you look at Travis's Instagram feed, you'll see a picture of him there in a wheelchair outside Vancouver General Hospital, right? What's the story? Yeah, uh, very pivotal, uh, I guess, moment or period of time. I was... Um, I was out training in Vancouver, um, and I was uh, hit by a car. I was hit head-on, um, took the most of the brunt on my left leg and dislocated my left hip, and I was thrown onto the road and uh, broke my neck, so I fractured four vertebrae in my neck and uh, had to have emergency surgery to uh, fuse my spine together and allow me to, to walk again, and there was a, yeah. a big period of, of rehab through there and, uh, you know, questions of whether I'd be able to walk again or not, and it was just a, it was a, a tough time for a lot of people, I think, and me included, And um, but it really was, I would say, a, a positive in my life, 100%. I definitely see it as a thing that allowed me to get really clear on what was important mm-hmm. in life and relationships and um uh and caring for those people around you and and not taking a day for granted um was definitely kind of hit home to, uh, throughout that experience um, right. well let's put this into yeah. context travis i know you say it's a positive but one thing the listeners don't know and you told me off air is you had a 97 percent chance of not walking again right yeah that's right okay so Okay. All right. So we had to put it into that context. That was the odds that you were facing. And this is March 2015. And a lot happened in that last six months. And, you know, if you wind back to 2014, am I right? You say you qualified for Kona in that November? Yeah, I raced in that. Well, I raced in Kona in, uh, in 2014. So the October of 2014. So I'd just come off Kona and I had a disappointing race there. I, I kind of, um, it's a tough, like it's a tough day. People, anyone who's been there knows it and not a lot of people get it right. But, um, I was so motivated after, after that race to, to improve the things that I needed to improve and control the things I could control. And, um, at that point in, in time, in, uh, I, you know, I went to, I took a, took some time in Lanzarote and went and trained with the BMC pro team there as a part of my um, my job at Lululemon gave me that chance. But I put in all these pieces in place and I was fitter than I've ever been. My goal was to to win my age group at Ironman Texas that year. Um, so I was really tracking really well to, to take the next step in my athletic career when this happened. Um, bam. So it was kind of, yeah, bam, that's kind of, you know, and uh, I think – Everything happens for reasons, but uh, yeah. So I was kind of at that crux of of you were flying, making this. Right? I was you, flying. I was at another level, and I was ready to to take that next step in my my athletic journey. So right, and you also started a relationship with the woman who you then became your wife, and yeah, literally two months before this happened. So everything kind of happened in a really compressed timeline. What was going through your head when you were you know sitting or lying in the hospital bed? I mean, there must have been dark thoughts going through it. I'm just curious to know. I mean, were you just completely positive all the time? I mean, you're a human being, right? You're not a robot. Yeah, totally. No, I definitely wasn't. It wasn't all um, sunshine and roses and rainbows. That's for sure. It was, I think it was a a time, well, the thing, and I want to preface that with, there was never a time where I thought, why me? And I think that's something that I can really be uh, be clear on is I never questioned why this had happened to me. I definitely was um, – there was times it was really hard. Like my mum came over to support me and take care of me and my, you know, girlfriend at the time it was a new relationship. I saw how hard it was on her. It was it was, uh, it was, was more of those feelings of, of um, you know, what? how am I going to get out of this or how is this right. going to affect the people around me and the people that I love? And I could control my thoughts to be – thinking about how I'm going to get back and the things that I wanted to do once I could, you know, start walking again and then start running and I couldn't wait to get back on my bike. And there was all these things where I just kept myself positive and moving forward day by day, Um, you know, and I had to catch myself in those moments where I was thinking that, I, you know, maybe it won't happen again. Maybe I won't be able to race again. And I had to, like, really 
challenge myself to not think those things and really turn my thoughts around to be more about when you do get a chance to race again or when you get a chance to get back on your bike, this is what you're going to do. And, and even more so in my life, like once I get out of hospital, here's the way that I want to really live my life and here's the things that are important to me and here's the things that I really want to focus on rather than the things that, were, that weren't that were adding value to my life. Okay, so let's talk about that. You had these these thoughts of clarity during this rehabilitation period where I guess what you had decided what was important in your life and you decided to dismiss what was a distraction or unimportant, right? When you came out of hospital, what had changed? What what do you decided that you were going to do that was different before, you know, everything that went in? Yeah, I think it was... Um... I think I was just getting really clear on what was important. And I, I, um, I was, well, <laughs> I had, uh, almost four months out of work or off work, um, which gave me a lot of time to really focus on just getting better and getting healthy and getting back to moving and activity. And I made a, you know, I made a, um, I made it my goal to try and qualify for Kona again. And, um, oh. you know, as un, un, as unrealistic as it seemed, um, I, I really wanted to focus on that and I used my rehabilitation sessions as my training session. So I'd really think about, you know, my time at the physio was another training session and my 10 minute walk that I was allowed to do, that was my training session for the day. So I still maintain that attitude of being an athlete, um, throughout that process. Um, and it also professionally gave me that opportunity to think about, what do I want to achieve in my professional career um, and how do I go about setting in place the steps to make that a reality? Mm. Um, I think that that was an important kind of time for me to get a little bit of clarity on what it is I wanted to achieve uh, in my professional life as well as what I wanted to get back to as an athlete. Right. So in your professional life, you had been – you know, in, in probably quite a coveted job working, you know, what you say was an easy job at Lululemon, but I don't think it was easy, right? So, you know, for a sports guy, that must have been a great job. You would have got to travel. As you said, you went to Lanzarote and trained with BMC. Yeah. You had a lot of opportunities. You know, why throw that away? Because for somebody who also was trying to qualify for Kona, you know, having – stability in your life through your career was probably you know a great place to work from right because you knew that you could finish at a certain time and you can go and do this and there's no worry about what's coming in and you know whether get you get money coming in at the end of the month as being an entrepreneur is obviously a challenge but you know if you've got a stable salary life that's a great base for being a you know an endurance athlete why go and sacrifice all that what was going on in your head yeah i think it's um it's a great question and a lot of people have asked me why and like I think my – the reason why is part of that process through my rehabilitation was um, try and keep the things in life that are serving you and the things that aren't serving you, get rid of them. So for me, I think whilst it was an, you know, quote unquote easy, it definitely wasn't an easy job. There was a lot of responsibility and um, it was the biggest event that the company um, – had ever done and it was uh, you know i had a team of almost 20 people um working for me so it definitely wasn't easy but more so around i i didn't have the freedom to create what i wanted to create as much as i wanted to um and there was always a piece of me that um, has been entrepreneurial and i think it kind of goes back to my time when i was a kid growing up around triathlon where i would um i would work on events and put together transition and set up the swim boys and, you know, put up fences and the finish line as a teenager so that I could get a free entry into the race the following day. So it was kind (laughs) of, I always had that. I was always in events and I always understood how they worked and I always used it and saw it as um, a chance to be creative and, you know, in that time make a bit of pocket money and get some free races. But point being is I really didn't want to waste another day. I never, Mm. I never want to see a day go to waste where I'm not doing anything that I'm passionate about and doing things that aren't serving me and serving my happiness and the the person that I want to be in the world. Right. So how did that distill as your, you know, your current business? How did that, you know, you say that you don't want to waste any time. 
you've come out let's just put this into context you've come out of hospital you're in a rehabilitation period you're still struggling a little bit but you're looking forward to qualifying for Kona and then you decide that you're going to go and start a business yeah I mean people must have been thinking, <laughs> what is this that guy doing wild. with his yeah I don't know I mean, you must have had some crazy. I mean, people probably are used to this from you from now, right? But I mean, imagine that you yeah. must have had some crazy conversations. Yeah, and I think it like, I think like nothing happened overnight. I don't think it was ever a, like I'm going to kind of wake up tomorrow and do this. It was, um, it was more of a gradual process of setting the pieces in place that uh, I needed to feel comfortable to be able to to make that decision, and you know, my wife to be feeling comfortable about it as well and um i you know what i think i work better um when i'm challenged and i work better when i have a lot on my plate and i think when i'm you know when i'm leaving time for myself or i've you know got more time than i know what to do with that's when i'm not as productive so i do like to be busy i like to be full days and lots of you know lots of interactions and conversations and meeting with people and connecting people and growing things and being creative like that's what gives me the energy that i need to be able to take on all of those things and you know where i was in my role there it wasn't it wasn't firing me up as much as i needed to to be able to take on all of those things that life was throwing at me so you know i'd rather keep myself energized through taking on more than i can handle than you know taking on less and not being as productive right. across the board Exactly. Well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about NTSQ Sports because you're taking on a big challenge there as well. You're not just doing one thing. You've got a lot of projects on the go. And just to give some background, one of the projects you're involved in is Inner Voice. And before this phone call, I was reading the Inner Voice website and I was reading an interview with Liz Blatchford, one of the pro Ironman triathletes out there on the circuit. Yeah. And it was just, you know, I was just getting into the interview and I realized, sorry, I realized, well, I've got to speak to Travis in a minute. And I was just, <laughs> got completely lost. I got completely drawn into it. I mean, it was powerful stuff. It was emotional stuff. Yeah. And that's right. just one of the things that you're doing. So just tell us about, you know, give, give us a rundown of all the different projects that you're involved in. Yeah, great. I think, um, well, I'll start with Inner Voice because you, you mentioned it. It's, um, for me, I was, um, I've always craved content. I've always been interested in reading and learning and, um, you know, taking in information from different sources. And I was constantly looking for something more from our, you know, our sports media. So triathlon magazines and, you know, I was looking for more content. It was a lot of it was this, you know, co copy and paste a name into the article and it could have been about anyone in the, in the sport. So I was looking for ways to, to get that, um, myself. And I thought, I know all of these amazing athletes through my time in the sport and the relationships I've developed. I know these incredible humans with incredible stories. And at the same time, I was working with amazing photographers when we were doing some of our initial content for the business. And, um, you know, some great friends who, and a, a really good friend of mine in Toronto who's an amazing writer and editor. So I kind of pitched it to them and said, hey, what about if we, contacted some of these athletes that we know and you know pair their stories with beautiful photography and great written content and tell it from their inner voice and that's where inner voice mm -hmm. came from is like it was literally we want to hear the story from them and a lot of the a lot of the content you do read on that platform is is that is the written words of the athletes so we give them a framework and you know we prompt them to share and um, it's them speaking. It's not us providing an interpretation of what they say. It's that's exactly what they say. And we just put it into a format that, you know, fits together nicely, but it's, it, it just goes to show that like those stories are super impactful yeah. and relatable because you could read any of those stories. And we have, I think we've got about 30 or so features on there right now. And, you know, at any given time, you can take something from that. Do, doesn't matter if you're a, an elite athlete or starting a new business or, um, you know, or thinking about starting your own business or whatever it is, like there's something in each of those articles that will give you the fuel and the fire and inspiration you need to, to give it a shot. So, definitely. Um, you've definitely so done, so, you, I mean, you've achieved when you say you wanted to do something different. I certainly, yeah. I felt it. I mean, I can't logically Good. express what it is, but it's an emotional thing. So yeah, we'll Great. put it in the well, show notes for some, you know, go and check it out in a voice. Yeah. Appreciate it. That's, uh, 
Yeah, it's, it's exactly the, the emotion we want to uh, invoke in people is, you know, it, it means something different to, to everyone who um, who takes it in and whatever you take from it, that's it's great. Um, so, yeah, so that's a big part of, of, of our um, business showing or creating content, which is important to me and it, it's a creative outlet for us as well, which is great. Um, another part of the business we have is uh, we have our NTSQ Velo uh, cycling retreats. So we host... Uh, cycling retreats throughout the U.S., um, partnering up with Relay and Chateau Hotels, so beautiful luxury hotels. And I've got a lot of friends of mine who are amazing chefs that are also cyclists, and we work with them on creating amazing culinary experiences. Um, and it's a really a, a chance for uh, our guests to experience what it's like to uh, go to a pro team camp. So there's that level of interaction and uh, there's that level of uh, experience on the cycling side. But then pair that with the best meals you've ever eaten and the best hotels you've ever stayed in um, and really just create life-changing experiences for people based around riding your bike, staying in beautiful hotels and eating great food. Um, and I mean, yeah, so that's that's another part which is super exciting. Um, and it's, I think it's another one of those things of kind of living my dream. That's, you know, I mm. love riding my bike. I love being out there. I love meeting people and sharing a glass of wine and a great meal. And um, to be able to bring those together and share that with people, um, Amazing. that super, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, brings chills to my spine just thinking about it, how good it is and how exciting it is for us. Um, and then the other piece of the business is, um, we, uh, we've got some participation events as well. So we, uh, we're about to execute on the, uh, Canadian Masters National Road Cycling Championships. Um, so that's the highest level of Masters racing here in Canada. So we have that event in uh, in Vancouver, and then another event that I'm super excited about is uh, it's a race called the Dirty Fill, and it's mm. a, a, a gravel fondo uh, here in Kelowna in BC, um, and it's really about uh, getting the joy of riding back into uh, into our guests and the people who experience the race. It's about it's not necessarily about riding the fastest time or you know beating your mate. It's about how can you go out and ride this ride, challenge yourself experience the adventure and uh and have some banter along the way and a couple of beers when you finish so um sounds awesome so that's it's yeah it'll be fun that's one's that one's gonna be a lot of fun so it sounds like you really love the the human interaction side of the whole sport i mean i'm just trying to get beyond the the fact that you're into endurance sports but you love that whole sort of connection experience whether it's the stories that you're relating through inner voice or you know it's the gravel fondo or it's the you know the cycling retreats it's this kind of experience where people can get together and really connect through endurance sports that seems to be a key part of what you're doing and i think back to you know those sort of there's very sort of vivid pictures that you painted of you know standing on the beach and all the pros coming out of the, the race and you're just waiting for the autographs and them giving you a pat on the back and all that kind of stuff it seems like that is now that that whole experience is still there in what you're doing, that real sort of human yeah. interactive experience. I wonder if that's some, something you think about and something you try to really focus on creating in your business. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned it because, you know what, it's very much a part of what we're trying to create and the mission for the, the business is to um, change people's lives through the power of endurance sports. And yeah. um, it's, not, it's funny you say it because it – I, now that you mention it and I can see it, it, everything I do love about the sport is based on the, the friends I've made and the um, connections I've made and the time spent out on the road with people and, you know, interacting and chatting over a coffee at the coffee shop mid-ride and things like that. Like, they're the things that I remember the most and, you know, telling those war stories after the race. And um, if we can create opportunities for people to have those experiences, then that is what's going to you know, drive me and drive our business to be successful. Um, and I, th I think it's, it's, in it's interesting because I, when I used to train, I used to love training alone. I actually used to love mm. getting out there and running on my own and riding on my own. And, um, I used to love that, that solo time when I was training, but the, my best memories are actually when I have the chance to connect with people around the sport so yeah it's just a kind of interesting juxtaposition of right you know where i'm at now and where i was when i was 
uh, at my you know peak of competition. So, how, how do you hold it all together? Because I mean, this is the thing that's this is the thought that's going through my head, and I imagine the listeners are wondering too: is that you know, organizing one event is a big deal. It's not just the day, isn't it? It's the months and even sometimes years that go into the planning process of an event beforehand that a lot of people don't see, but you're not just yeah. organizing one event, you're organizing a number of events. And then you've got inner voice and then you're training on top of this. Yeah. How does it all work? Yeah. Uh, if you ask my wife, she might say it doesn't all work together <laughs> every, all the time. Um, but I think, I think it's about that human connection. Like I really have an amazing team that, that works for me and works with me. And, um, I really rely on them to, uh, fulfill their part of the vision. And it's not, you know, I, I don't ever want them to feel like they're not able to create their own vision. So I think it's part of it is me setting the vision of here's what we want to create and here's why we want to do it. And here's how it fits together. And now put your interpretation on it. Um, but there's also, you know, there's a lot of times where, um, you know, we're not keeping it together. Deadlines are missed and, you know, mm. permits don't come through in time or, you know, we didn't sign that sponsorship contract or like it, not everything works, but it's about how you adapt to those circumstances and situations. And, um, I think I'm, to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of fueled by the adrenaline of being an entrepreneur and, and having many balls in the air and trying to see how much you can take on while still keeping it together. And, yeah. um, well, I'm cur think, curious about yeah. that because you, you're, you've been a very successful age group athlete. You qualified for Kona and being an endurance athlete. And I'm sure the listeners can relate to this is that it's very much about fol following a formula, isn't it? You know, whether yep. it's the formula that your coach tells you, or it's the one that you read in the, the training Bible or whatever you, it's a plan. You can follow the plan. And if you just execute that plan, and do it really well and increase your intensity, you're going to get results, right? Whereas yeah. starting a business, a little bit different. A, there is no plan. Yeah. Nobody says, right, okay, unless you're doing, you know, a, a franchise business, which is what you're not doing, you've got no plan. You don't know if you do this and focus all your time on this particular model, that's going to be the right model that works. So it's pretty open. So it's kind of like a different mindset. I'm wondering how yeah. you adapted. You know, you went in from being really what is a controlled world, isn't it, as an athlete? It's all about control and trying to, you know, lock everything down and perfect everything. And then you're going into this world where it's completely the opposite. How did you adapt to that? Did you adapt well at the early stages of being an entrepreneur? Yeah, um, I think two two things. I think... Um, I think part of my my best success as an athlete when it was when it actually wasn't as controlled and as planned. I actually found more success in having a bit more of a fluid idea of um, and a bit more of an understanding of how I functioned as an athlete. So I would give myself, you know, here's the six or eight, you know, key sessions I'd like to do during the week. Um, and then make sure I fit those around my work schedule or my life schedule or whatever, my sleep schedule, how I felt that day. So I was, a, I was actually a little bit more fluid with that. So I think that's how I work a little bit better. Um, but coming back to your question is, um, I had like, it's funny. I say I had no idea when I first started. I didn't really have an idea of how much work it would be to be an entrepreneur, but I also, I'm also i also have a thirst for knowledge and understanding and connecting with people. So I really reached out to or stay in touch with people who have been through similar or the same process, and every business is different. Every entrepreneur is different, but there's things you can learn from people who have been through and made those mistakes themselves that can guide you in your decision-making. And I think it's all about – and back to the, the point of being an athlete, I think it's also about – all the data points you can create. So giving yourself enough information where you can make informed decisions rather than like throwing mud against the wall and seeing what sticks. It's I'll try this thing for, you know, two to three weeks or, and see, you know, does that catch or does that work? And then, okay, shift the focus a little bit. And it's not the whole plan, but it's, you're just kind of really focusing in on what works and what doesn't work. And mm. I think, a perfect example would be around inner voice. Like if you go back and look at our at our content from July to now, what was July when we first started to the point now, it's changed a lot over time. So we've identified 
you know, what are people looking to interact with? How do the photos work better? What is the, you know, what are the athletes that we want to tell stories about? So it actually, we've kind of just adapted as we've gone. Um, so I think the point being is uh, I work better being fluid and being adaptable and being able to change and not being so structured around a plan. Um, but it's also recognizing that as well and, and not just making decisions for the sake of making decisions. It's one thing I'd, I'd tell to my team is, um, always ask yourself why. So, you know, if you come up with a new idea or a new concept or a new way of doing things, ask yourself why. Why are you doing it that way? Um, you know, if it's going to be better or more efficient or work better, then let's do it. And if it's not, let's set it aside. So um, mm, just always always being inquisitive around why you're doing things. And I think um, that's why I'm super excited about us as an events company and as about our business is – NTSQ stands for never the status quo. So it's literally, I don't want to be like every other event and every other race and every other company that does it our way. I want to pave the path for new ways of doing things, new ways of creating events, new ways of having experiences for people. So we're constantly striving for new and innovative ways of doing things. And I'm sure that along the way, we're going to make some mistakes and you know, no, people aren't going to respond to the events or the whatever we create. But if you're not challenging yourself and you're not pushing that status quo, then you're just going to remain the same. And that's definitely not what I left a, a quote unquote safe job for. Yeah. And it's great advice and it's for people to follow. Great life philosophy as well. Well, let's stick with that why for a minute, Travis, because you're going to go through another life-changing event coming up now you're you and your partner your wife you're expecting a baby in a matter of weeks now and i'm just yep. wondering that's your why is going to change right your whole i mean you're not necessarily going to change as a person but you're going to have something else now to live for something else to think about on top of what you're already doing i yep. mean you must be as excited as hell but at the same time a little bit scared Absolutely. I think, uh, well, it's funny. I actually started a, a website called terrifiedandexcited.com, <laughs> um, which I haven't done anything with, but it was actually because of my whole thoughts about being a new father is, um, I'm, you know, completely terrified about what, what's to come, but I'm also so excited. And mm -hmm. you mentioned another, another why and, uh, you know, what more alter, what more inspiration or motivation do you need than, than, you know, bringing a child into the world and into your family? I think that's, you know, the ultimate piece of like, uh, you know, you, so far you do things for yourself and for your significant other and you kind of, now you have this other, um, other person and being that you're trying to create for and it gives me extra motivation to put in the hard yards to be able to provide a, an amazing life for my daughter. So yeah. yeah, it's uh it's, I think it's the ultimate for, for me and my wife to be able to, you know, keep the legacy alive and, and keep charging ahead with, with what we do have um, rather than it being a burden. Yeah. Fantastic. Good for you. Also on the, the legacy tip as well, you've got a very interesting project coming up this 300 mile ride across the U S with chefs for kids. What's the story there? Yeah, I, uh, actually, so it's called chef cycle and it's, uh, as you mentioned, it's a 300 mile ride, uh, over three days based in Santa Rosa, California. And I was lucky enough to be invited to do the ride last year. Um, and the, the goal is to last year was to raise a million dollars for a charity called no kid hungry. Um, and the, the goal there is that no kid in the U.S. goes hungry and goes without food. Um, so they support a lot of food programs in schools and um, a lot of advocacy work and basically just trying to create better opportunities for kids to be their best. And as you know, without food, you, you know, you're not thinking, you're not interacting, you're not being your best self. So I think it's a super important thing that uh, that I – feel very you know strongly about and believe in and um as i say last year i was able to to do the ride with a number of amazing chefs throughout the u.s and and then through that process i was able to you know meet a, a you know a business partner of mine now and some other people who are probably lifelong friends and um yeah we're doing it all again it's uh last year it was i think it was 200 200 chefs raising wow. a million this year it's 300 chefs raising two million so uh, a really cool charity that I really support and just a, another way to, to interact with amazing people. And I imagine, yeah. 
Yeah, it's funny because last year, you know, I did the the ride, and being an athlete, you kind of never consider, you know, quitting. Or a hundred miles is a long way, but it's not out of this world long way for you know in a day. And there were some of these chefs who literally had started riding a couple of months ago, had raised upwards of ten thousand dollars, and got themselves on a bike, and it was an opportunity to change their lives. Like that industry is, you know, rife with. Um, people who are overweight, who are working long hours and drug and alcohol abuse. And it's a very unhealthy industry. So for seeing these chefs change their lives through cycling and through giving back was, it was amazing to see and like to see how much effort they had to put in to get through a hundred miles day after day is, it was kind of like a, it was like a recognition of like, wow, this is something that isn't easy. And it's, you know, it's something mm. difficult for these people to go through, but it's making a huge impact on their lives and it's having a, a massive ripple effect on their their close knit community, but then the broader community with within the charity. So Yeah. Love just to a see really that. cool thing. I yeah. can't imagine what it must be like to get three hundred chefs together. I mean, you know, famously to get two chefs together is hard work. <laughs> And on the same team, so to speak, but to get totally. three hundred to get together, you know. Well maybe just all the ego goes out the window. You know? Well, you'd like to think so, but it wasn't the case, that's for sure. <laughs> it's it very competition. Uh, oh, man, it was like you, they were all there for the right reasons, obviously, and they wanted to make a positive impact. But it was, you know, it was you're riding in a group of these chefs and each of them were trying to be the chef. And the, you know, the, the, the big dog and the, the guy who was controlling the group that you're riding with. And it was just, uh, oh, yeah. it was kind of an interesting dynamic to see the some of the egos come into play. And, you, you know, you've got your, there was guys there with, you know, two or three, I don't know if there was any three Michelin star chefs there, but there was these guys who had created huge empires around cooking um, who were vulnerable in like riding yeah. their bike and they were pushing themselves and they, they did, they weren't the big dog anymore, you know, they were kind of just another face in the crowd. So Amazing. yeah, it was kind of a, an interesting thing to see. Yeah. Love to see that. Fantastic. Well, it's been a real pleasure, a real privilege speaking to you, Travis. Where do we find out more about you? Yeah, I think, uh, Instagram is a good spot for, to follow me. So it's at Trav McKenzie. Uh, and then we have our website. So if you go to ntsqsports.com. Um, you'll be able to follow along all of the business adventures there. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm on Facebook. So if you want to chat or learn more or send me a note, please do. You can uh, look me up. It's tra- at, uh, Trav McKenzie, uh, at Trav McKenzie. Yeah. On Facebook as well. So, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. Excellent. And we'll put all the details in the show notes. Every, um, method that people can get in contact with you, find out more about your businesses as well as chef cycles. You know, I think it's a fantastic story. You're an inspiration. And I think a lot of people listening to your story, you know, will your story will resonate with them and hopefully make change as well. Because, you know, as you say yourself, right at the top of the show, anything is possible. Yeah. You know, you've, you've really taught people through your life that it is possible. And hopefully that will make change in other people's lives. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing that journey with us today, Travis. That's Travis McKenzie, everybody. I'm an entrepreneur, Kona qualifier, and soon to be dad. So we wish him all the best with his upcoming adventures. Travis, thanks very much for coming today. Brian, thanks for having me, mate. I really appreciate it. Endurance FM, voice of the endurance sport business. Find out more at www.endurancefm.com.